Thank you, Mr. President. I rise to speak about the conference report that we'll be voting on later this evening. But before I do that, I, I want to mention a few folks by name who deserve a big thank you for the incredible work they did to get us to this terrific point that we are at today. I want to start with Leader McConnell. His vision and leadership made this possible, and I am grateful for that. I want to mention Chairman Hatch, who also helped to guide the Finance Committee, which has the jurisdiction over our tax code. Chairman Enzi, the chairman of the Budget Committee, without a proper budget resolution, this moment would not have been possible. Chairman Murkowski, who has fought for so long to open up this little tiny postage stamp in uh, an incredibly remote part of Alaska to prudent energy development. And finally, tonight we're going to pass the legislation to do that. Senator Cornyn, our whip, who uh, is also a member of the Finance Committee and played a really important role. Senators Thune and Portman and Scott, with whom I worked really, really closely for a very extended period of time to try to find the consensus that I think we've reached among Republican senators. I want to mention Senator Corker. I had many long and ultimately very fruitful conversations with Senator Corker, who uh, was just a approach this in a very thoughtful and responsible way, and I'm grateful for him. I want to mention some of the staff that worked incredibly hard on this. Uh, Mark Warren, who uh, handles tax policy for Senator Thune, and, and Zach Rudisill, who works for Senator Portman, Shay Hawkins, who handles this brief for Senator Scott, Andrew Syracuse, who uh, works for Senator Cornyn, and Bart Massey, who handles this responsibility for Senator Enzi. All did terrific work. Uh, big special thanks to uh, some of the guys on my staff that did an amazing job. Randy Herndon joined my team uh, just earlier this year and did an absolutely extraordinary job. Fortunately, he has a incredible wealth of knowledge about tax policy, and he was able to put that to work for Pennsylvanians and for Americans in a tremendously constructive way. Brad Grants, my legislative director, who also helped to guide this process, and uh, Dan Brandt, who is my chief of staff and who uh, did some great quarterbacking. I should point out the Senate Finance Committee staff that worked just incredible hours and did a great job. Jay Kosla, Mark Prater, and Jenna Cunha, and the rest of the Senate Finance Committee staff, also Brendan Dunn in the leader's office, who. Uh, played a really important role. Speaker Ryan and Chairman Brady uh, in the other chamber played an indispensable role in getting us here, as did Tom Barthold, who leads the Joint Committee on Taxation, quantifying every wrinkle along the way in the final product, as well as his team. Should mention also, the President provided constructive leadership along the way, and we worked extensively with Treasury Secretary Mnuchin and the Director of the National Economic Council, Gary Cohn from the White House. So, Mr. President, this, um, this took a long time to come together, and it involved an enormous amount of work. But I am so proud of what we have brought to this floor and what I believe we're going to pass um, later this evening. The process started over a year ago when members of the Finance Committee began to tackle what seemed like a very daunting challenge, the most ambitious tax reform in 31 years. Could we really overhaul the entire tax code and achieve two really, really important accomplishments and do it with the very narrow majority we have, knowing that our Democratic friends did not want to participate in this process and try to get this all the way across the goal line? I am thrilled to be able to report I think we've accomplished those two big things. And what are they, Mr. President? Number one, we were determined from the beginning that we would not even attempt to bring a bill to the floor unless it lowered the tax burden on the families that we represent, individuals, families, middle income and lower income families. That was number one. And number two, we wanted to fundamentally restructure the business side of our tax code so that American workers and businesses can compete and win in a global economy against anybody. And I, I've got to tell you, we did those things. And I think that's why this is going to pass tonight. First, on the individual side, this is absolutely a direct tax cut for the vast, overwhelming majority of low- and middle-income taxpayers. They will simply pay less in federal taxes. That's the reality. By the way, most high-income taxpayers will have some savings as well. I don't apologize for that. 
I'm in favor of lowering the tax burden on everyone. And while not every last individual is going to have a tax cut, the vast majority of people will. We do it through a variety of mechanisms. I won't go through all of them, but a couple of the mechanisms that I think people understand and appreciate is, one, we double the standard deduction. What does that mean? That means that a couple filing jointly, as most married couples do, the first $24,000 of income they earned doesn't get taxed at all. Zero. Nothing. They don't owe a dime to the federal government on the first $24,000 that they earn. That one step alone results in a tax reduction for many, many millions of Americans. But in addition, we lower marginal tax rates so that the income people start earning above $24,000 gets taxed at lower rates under our bill than under current law. And we also dramatically increase the child tax credit so families with children get this additional benefit in, on top of the ones I just mentioned. The net effect of all this is every single income category pays less in taxes. That's according to the joint tax. You don't have to take my word for it. That's the joint tax nonpartisan review of our bill. And low-income earners receive the largest percentage benefit of all. Now, for people who are listening to this debate, whether in the chamber here or, or on watching C-SPAN, I can understand that they could be a little frustrated because they hear our Democratic colleagues say this is a terrible deal for the middle class. Some have even said it's a tax increase. And they've heard me and other Republicans say this is absolutely a tax cut for the middle class. Who are they to believe? I understand that frustration. But let me suggest there's a simple way to cut through all this. There's two, actually. Number one, look what happened on the Senate floor during the debate on this the same sort of argument was taking place when a Democratic senator offered an amendment to take our tax policy for low and middle income families and individuals and make it permanent. Now, if this was a bad deal for the middle class, presumably all the Democratic senators would vote no. But they did not. They voted yes. They, it was really quite an extraordinary compliment to our work that they offered an amendment to take what we did which is not yet permanent. We weren't able to do that. We're going to come back and revisit that, and I hope we will make it permanent. But they took what we did and said, this is so good, we should make it permanent right now. So I appreciate the compliment. I appreciate the validation of the tax cut that this is for low-income and middle-income families. And I want to work with them to make sure that it is permanent. We'll, we should be able to do that. The second way that we know where does the truth lie in this debate in late January, early February, just check your paycheck. Take a look. Withholding's gonna go down because you're gonna owe less money to Uncle Sam. So you're gonna get a take home pay raise. It's as simple as that. So the mystery will be all gone when people take a look at their check and discover, yeah, look at that. I actually got the pay raise that those Republican guys said we were gonna get. So I'm looking forward to when that happens and at that point I think this debate will shift to other topics, that's my guess. But I also want to touch on the tax reform on the business side, Mr. President, because that is what I think is really likely to drive the economic growth and the opportunities that I want to see created for the people I represent. It comes in a context. The context is the weakest economic recovery in the history of the Republic. After a very severe recession in 2008, we'd never really had the booming recovery that we have always had in the past. It's not a huge mystery why our Democratic friends had complete control of the elected government, and they did all the things they wanted to do. They had the ability, and they did. Huge repeated tax increases with no reforms, a virtual takeover of health care, an avalanche of new regulations, and a massive spending binge. They did all of those things, and unsurprisingly, we got a weak economy, not a strong economy. In one of the specific problems that we have had that's plagued us ever since that recession is a collapse in the growth of the capital stock, which caused a collapse in the growth of productivity. And without productivity, it is not at all surprising that workers aren't getting raises. The path to higher wages for workers is allowing workers to become more productive. To be more productive, they need better tools. And better tools are acquired through investment. So that was lacking, Mr. President, and that is the heart of what we're fixing. Our reform goes right to this challenge of lowering the cost 
of deploying capital. What, is that, what I mean by deploying capital? What I mean is investing in the very kind of equipment that makes workers more productive and allows them to earn higher wages. A, a simple example, Mr. President, if you go to a construction site and there's two guys working, one of them's working a backhoe and the other's working a shovel. They're both digging a hole. They're both moving dirt. Which one do you think is getting paid more? The guy operating the backhoe is always making more money because he's able to be so much more productive than any human can be with just his bare hands and a shovel. And so when we make it more affordable for business to go out and buy new tractors, new equipments, new machinery, that gives them the chance to put those more valuable tools in the hands of their workers. By the way, someone also has to build those things. Someone has the job at Caterpillar of making that tractor. Someone has the job of making that vehicle. Someone has the job of making the machinery. So all of these things coming together are a very powerful driver of economic growth. Not the only one. Not only do we lower the cost of acquiring that equipment, we also lower the top rate that businesses pay. We, we have arguably the most uncompetitive tax code in the world, a top rate of 35 percent. What we do in our bill is we lower that rate to 21 percent, slightly below the average of the nations we compete with, pretty close to the average. And this is going to just free up American workers and business to compete and win in all kinds of fields where we're getting beaten today. That's, that's going to come to an end because when we have a chance to compete on a level playing field, American workers and American business, we compete and we usually win. We're going to get back to winning, Mr. President. We also um, recognize that most businesses in America are not organized as C-Corps. They're organized as pass-throughs. We call them pass-throughs. Small, subchapter S companies, partnerships. And so we have a um, corollary, a reduction in tax rates for them. It comes as a deduction against their earnings. It doesn't apply to all partnerships. Uh, professional services partnerships, for instance, don't get this treatment. And I, I'd like to revisit that. I think we, uh, we want to revisit that because I, I personally would like to see this treatment expanded to that category. But the vast majority of businesses, partnerships, S-Corps, C-Corps are going to experience a significant tax cut that is going to allow them to compete. Another big important feature is moving away from this global taxation system we have. You know, Mr. President, we've all been so disturbed by the stories we've read about of companies inverting, company, American companies being acquired, sometimes by a much smaller company overseas, not because the economics of the transaction uh, make a lot of sense, but because the tax code drives them. It just makes very little sense from a tax point of view to have a multinational company headquartered in the United States. So we've been driving these transactions that are terrible. They usually cost us jobs. They cost us growth. This comes to an end with this reform. We're not going to have this system where we punish business for bringing money back home to the United States. This, this punishment ends, and it's going to encourage a huge inflow of capital, of accumulated profits, back into the United States because no longer will companies be facing a penalty tax unique in the world. Uh, that's over very, very constructive development. So, what, what does it mean, Mr. President, when you take one of the world's worst business tax codes and you turn it into arguably one of the best? It means more investment. It means more people all around the world are going to want to invest in America. It means more Americans are going to want to invest in starting a new business or expanding an existing business. It means more business will be able to afford the tools and the equipment and the vehicles that I referred to earlier. That's the source of economic growth. Some of our colleagues on the other side don't seem to acknowledge that this is a reality. Um, but there's no great mystery here. When you lower the cost of something, you get more of it. And when we lower the cost that we impose on businesses becoming more productive, we will have more productivity. All of this comes at a very interesting time in the economic cycle. And what I'm referring to is the fact that we're arguably close to what economists think of as full employment, 4.1%, 4%. Very seldom does the American economy go below 4% for extended periods. So what does that mean? It means when this money gets put to work, when companies go out and start buying this equipment, 
They need workers both to fill the orders, but then they need workers to operate the equipment. Demand for workers is going to go up. And what happens when demand for workers goes up at a time when there's a relatively small number who are not employed? It means upward pressure on the wages of those workers. This is exactly the dynamic we've been waiting for. And we're going to trigger that, and we're going to watch this happen. I think it's going to start relatively quickly, probably next year, that we will start to see upward pressure on wages. And that means the people that I represent, they're going to find that they've got options. They've got higher compensation. They're getting a pay raise because their employer, it's not because employers suddenly wake up one day and decide, oh, I'll just be more generous today. It's nothing of the sort. This is the only way they can hold on to their workforce, hold on to the employees that they need. So it's very likely that we're going to see an increasing share of the total economic output in the hands of the workers who produce it, and I think that's a terrific development. Um, a couple of other points I want to touch on briefly, uh, Mr. President. One is that this legislation also effectively repeals the individual mandate of Obamacare. What, technically, what we do is we zero out the penalty. The penalty for noncompliance goes to zero. And so that's equivalent to repeal. Um, first of all, this is a great strike for freedom, in my view. It is appalling to think that the federal government has the right to force an American to buy a product against his or her will, uh, a terrible infringement on the freedom of Americans. Um, our Democratic colleagues have described this repeal as a stake through the heart of Obamacare. Think of what a damning indictment that is about Obamacare. If it's a stake through the heart, if the only way Obamacare can survive is if people are forced to buy the product against their wishes, <laughs> what kind of product could that be? What kind of business model? depends on forcing people to buy your product because they won't buy it if it's voluntary. So not only is it uh, a, a significant strike for freedom, it's also tax relief for low-income folks. Um, you know, this Obamacare penalty in Pennsylvania, my state, and I think my state is typical, 83% of the people who get hit with this tax penalty are in a household that earns less than $50,000 a year. So this is more direct relief for low and middle income folks. Um, last point I want to make, and I see my colleague from Ohio who did amazing, great work uh, getting us to this point. He was a pleasure to work with and enormously knowledgeable, and I just want to congratulate him for uh, where we are. Um, I want a quick word about the deficits, um, and let me start with a very simple observation. I'm convinced. When we pass this legislation and it is signed into law, the federal budget deficits will shrink as a result of this legislation. It's very simple, Mr. President, and the reason I say that is the economic growth, the response to the reforms, the very profound reforms we're making, are going to give us a bigger economy to tax. And the extra growth, the bigger economy, means more re revenue to the federal government. So you could reasonably ask, well, OK, how much more growth do you really need, though, in order to offset the lost revenue that comes from some of the changes you're making? And fortunately, that's a simple exercise in arithmetic. We know what the answer is. Whether it's joint tax or the Congressional Budget Office, the nonpartisan analysis is we will need to average between 2 and 4 tenths of a percent of extra GDP growth, extra economic growth, each year on average for the next 10 years. If we do that, then we will have a smaller deficit as a result of this legislation, not a larger one. So you know, for me, what this bill comes down to is a simple question. Do you believe in America? Do you believe in the capacity of the American people to restore the vibrant growth that we used to take for granted? Decade after decade of annual growth of over 3% that caused people's wages to rise and standard of living to grow. And we've had this period that's been stagnant. And some of our friends think, well, that's, that's what America is now. Just get used to it, accept that that's the new normal, barely 2% growth if you're lucky. Mr. President, I think that's nonsense. And it's not true. Mm -hmm. I still believe in America. I still believe in American workers. I still believe in our system. I still believe that we are capable of restoring the kind of growth that has always been our birthright. I think this legislation takes a huge step 
in that direction. It is a direct, immediate tax cut and therefore pay raise for the hardworking people that I represent. And it is a series of reforms that is going to encourage economic growth that will result in higher wages and a better standard of living as well. Mr. President, I am thrilled with the opportunity we have tonight, and I urge all of my colleagues to support this legislation, and I yield the floor.